Hello, everybody. Welcome this afternoon. My name is Mark Keller. I'm the Executive Director of Advancement and Community Relations at Medicine Hat College, and I'm also honored to be a director with Medicine Hat and District Chamber of Commerce. From the board this afternoon, we also have Steve Hyde, and one of the members, and uh, happy to have him with us this afternoon. And I'm also pleased and honored to uh, welcome Drew Barnes, the um, MLA for Cypress Medicine Hat, as well as Michaela Glasgow, the MLA for Brooks Medicine Hat. Thank you both for making time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. And on behalf of the Chamber Board and staff, please accept our special thanks to the Government of Alberta for this opportunity and for joining us today. Due to unforeseen circumstances, the Honorable Doug Schweitzer, Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation, was unable to join us. In his place, I'm particularly pleased, though, to welcome the Honorable Demetrius Nic Nicolaides, pardon me, Minister of Advanced Education, for a virtual presentation on Alberta's economic recovery plan. He'll also discuss Alberta 2030, Building Skills for Jobs. That's a new vision for Alberta's post-secondary sector, launched just recently on April 29th. April 20, or pardon me, Alberta 2030 is the result of an extensive comprehensive review of our system and establishes a clear vision for post-secondary in Alberta through six overarching goals, all of which have objectives and flagship initiatives. The Honourable Demetrios Nicolaides will also present on these subjects, followed by a Q&A period open to all attendees. You can also visit the Government of Alberta's website for more information on Alberta's recovery plan. Today's session is being held in a Zoom meeting format, so feel free to turn your cameras on but please do remain muted. If you have questions, you can post those through the chat feature located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In addition, you can change your view settings as well as by clicking on the view options at the bottom of your screen. There are also reactions at the bottom of your screen, so if you wish to show your appreciation with a round of applause, please do. If there are technical difficulties, please email accounts at medicinehatchamber.com. And finally, the resources and recording of today's meeting will be circulated to all attendees following the meeting. We will also share the recording of the meeting through the e-newsletter on Monday. And I must mention, of course, the hardworking people who are making this all happen. With us today, we have Kristen Walsh, the events coordinator and our events tech for today, thank you. Chantelle Fisher, membership services coordinator with the chamber. Chantelle Ago, marketing and events event manager, Catherine Tingley, the administrative coordinator, Hannah Dupree, interim policy and communications coordinator, and our newest member, and I'm happy to say recent graduate of Medicine Hat College, Joshua Schaefer, who is a special projects assistant. And of course, we have our executive director, Lisa Kowalczyk. Thank you all for your time and the effort in making this event happen today. So the introduction, not to uh, delay this any further, Minister Nicolades was elected to the Legis Legislative Assembly of Alberta on April 16th, 2019, as the MLA for Calgary Bow and is a born and raised Calgarian. An expert in conflict resolution, he has extensive training in arbitration, is an accredited mediator, and has a PhD in the field. He has been active in peace building, peace building and reconciliation activities in Cyprus and has consulted in high stakes arbitrations and regulatory hearings in Alberta, BC and Manitoba. 
Prior to his election, he served as the head of the Calgary office for a national communication consulting firm, working closely with key players in the energy sector. He was appointed Alberta's Minister of Advanced Education on April 30th, 2019, and he brings his experience as an author, university lecturer, mediator, and communications expert to his ministry. Welcome, Mr. Minister. The virtual stage is yours. Well, Mark, thank you so much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure for, uh, for me to, to be here with all of you today. Um, and uh, uh, just, just reflecting, Mark, on some of your introductory comments, I can assure you that uh, many of my conflict resolution skills are used extensively uh, in, in government uh, on, on, a, on a consistent basis, certainly a, a place where, where the skills come in handy. Uh, but uh, again, it's a real honor and, uh, and privilege uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, I, I'll, I'll dedicate uh, most of my, my time today to a discussion around, or a presentation, excuse me, around Alberta 2030, which is a new 10-year uh, strategic plan for Alberta's post-secondary system. Now, obviously, you, you may be thinking, well, if we just announced it, we're only nine years away from 2030. Uh, and, and I blame COVID for that because we started the effort um, in early uh, 2020 before the pandemic, and we're hoping to have it completed by that time, uh, but the pandemic delayed things. So we have a 10-year plan, which is in reality a nine-year plan. Uh, but it's a really exciting effort, and I'm really uh, happy and fortunate to have the opportunity to talk uh, a little bit more about it. But what I will do first, if I may, I'll, I'll preface that by talking a little bit about the Alberta Recovery Plan, because I know Minister Schweitzer uh, was originally uh, planning on attending to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Alberta Recovery Plan. So I'll touch on that and how that connects into Alberta 2030. So the Alberta Recovery Plan is uh, essentially the Alberta government's response to the uh, post-pandemic uh, recovery. We uh, were on track to be able to move past this, uh, this pandemic, uh, hopefully, in a couple of short months. I know with the latest rounds of restrictions remind us that we're still in the thick of it, but uh, there's some very promising signs. We are getting more and more vaccines on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as was announced yesterday, opening we're opening up vaccine appointments to more and more Albertans. And we anticipate that by the end of May, so just a few weeks away, about 48% of Albertans will be vaccinated. By the end of June, we anticipate that number to be uh, north of 65%. And, um, and, and once we get to that level, we do really foresee that the summer will be full of festivals, fairs, large gatherings, and getting back to a high degree of normalcy. And with that in mind, uh, a lot of attention needs to turn towards our economic action plan. And uh, we need to ensure that we're putting measures in place now so that we can um, hit the ground running because we anticipate, uh, and many economists are, are predicting this as well, that there'll be a surge of economic activity after the pandemic. I, I recently had an opportunity to participate in a webinar with uh, Todd Hirsch, a chief economist at ATB, who's uh, similarly predicting a surge of economic growth after the pandemic as well. Major banks like Desjardins, Bank of Montreal, uh, and, and many others are all similarly forecasting that there'll be significant economic growth, not just in Alberta, but across the country. But more interestingly and more excitingly, they're all predicting that Alberta will lead the country in economic growth uh, following the, the pandemic. And again, we want to make sure we have the right foundations in place and we're doing the policy work now so that when we are moved, when we have moved past the pandemic, all of those foundations are in place to ensure a strong recovery. We want, we need to ensure Albertans are able to find job opportunities right here at home. We're attracting investment and we uh, recognize the importance of doing this work now. In fact, this work has already been underway for almost a year. We launched the Alberta Recovery Plan last summer and uh, have initiated some very key elements of that recovery plan already. At a very high level, 
the recovery plan focuses on building and uh, diversifying the economy. And when we say building, it doesn't just mean building on a, from a physical standpoint, building infrastructure. That's certainly a part of it. And Alberta's government is investing uh, heavily in building new infrastructure, new roads, bridges, schools, hospitals, and accelerating other projects. These infrastructure projects help get Albertans to work right now and also help to create more long-term job opportunities. So building of infrastructure is an important part of our economic recovery. It also has to do with building our capacity as a province. And that's where the Ministry of Advanced Education and Labor and Immigration and others come in because it's about building the capacity and skill set of Albertans to be ready to meet the new economic challenges that are ahead of us. And, and, and that's where I'll plug in. But just before I do, another key pillar of the recovery plan, as I mentioned, focuses on diversifying our economy. Yes, we need to continue to provide strong support for our energy sector, but we also need to take steps to support the development of new industries, whether that's in tech uh, or uh, biosciences, aviation, film, and television. We have enormous potential in these areas. We're already seeing strong signs of growth, whether that's in film, in television, um, or, or even in tech. Recently, a large tech firm announced uh, the development of a major office in Calgary. So we're seeing positive signs of growth, like a, like a garden. We're starting to see little green shoots spouting up. And we want to we want to make sure that the soil conditions are optimal to allow those industries to grow for success. So the recovery plan focuses uh, de also develops uh, what we're calling some very specific sector strategies, a number of targeted initiatives and policy responses to support key areas like tech, agriculture, uh, film and television, and others. Now, this, uh, this coming summer, when, when uh, we have put the, uh, the pandemic behind us, we'll be putting renewed effort uh, behind the recovery plan. So you will be seeing much more of the recovery plan front and center in terms of government priority uh, this coming summer. But uh, I, as I mentioned, I would like to talk a little bit more about Alberta 2030 and some of the initiatives that are underway within advanced education to help support uh, the recovery. So I'm gonna share my, uh, my slide deck here that I'm starting at the end for some reason, but we'll, we'll jump back to the very beginning. So uh, as I mentioned, we have recently announced what we're calling, calling Alberta 2030, building skills for jobs. Before I jump into the details of this, I wanna provide you with a little bit of context. As I've mentioned, Alberta 2030 is a 10 year uh, strategic plan for higher education in our province. And this is quite unique because this is actually the first time in 15 years that our province has a comprehensive strategic plan for our post-secondary system. Don't ask me how we went 15 years without one. I, I, don't, I don't have the answer to that, but uh, we, we have one that will help uh, move us forward. Now, Alberta 2030 develops policy and initiatives to respond to many key areas. Uh, as I mentioned, it helps to support Alberta's recovery plan. It also addresses recommendations of the Auditor General, the McKinnon panel, and also helps to take proactive steps to meet the changing nature of work and the changing skill demands that students and employers are facing. So I'll, I'll jump through this slide, but again, you can see some of the specific recommendations here that we've been operating off of, including from the Auditor General and the McKinnon panel. Now, in order for us to get a better understanding of where we needed to focus and how to build this plan, it was critical and important to me that we develop this plan with extensive engagement and consultation. I didn't believe it would be appropriate for me to devise a 10-year strategic plan in isolation and then provide that to our post-secondary institutions. 
but I believed it essential and important for us to build this new plan together. And we've done precisely that. We held over 115 one-on-one -on -one interviews with post-secondary presidents, student leaders, employers, faculty representatives. We conducted over 30 roundtable discussions, uh, received over 5,600 survey responses, 200 workbook submissions, and attracted over 1,500 participants in a variety of different town halls. Not to mention, we also supplemented this work with in-depth analysis uh, from with uh, using the services of McKinsey to give us some more in-depth analysis and uh, global jurisdictional analysis. We wanted to take a close look at what other jurisdictions around the world are doing to respond uh, to the skills demands of the future. So it was a, a, a very robust effort, but also a very challenging effort to take all of these different opinions and synthesize them into a strategy that, uh, that everyone can get behind. So a, a really challenging effort, but I am very happy to say that we have received a strong statements of support and endorsement from many post-secondary presidents, student leaders, and employer groups. So I think we achieved our goal of developing some broad consensus as it relates to this strategy. Now, of course, within a strategy, the most important thing that we need to have to lead the effort is a clear vision. So that's where we began. And we developed a clear vision for our post-secondary system. And you'll see that here in front of you. The vision emphasizes the importance of equipping Albertans with the skills, knowledge, and competencies they need to succeed in their lifelong pursuits. Whether that's a career in the trades or a career in fine arts, Every Albertan needs the strongest possible skills and level of knowledge to be able to succeed. And we believe that must be one of the core pursuits of our post-secondary system. We also believe that our system must respond to labor market needs. We have areas of shortage, whether that's in the skilled trades, aviation, or in the tech sector. We do have uh, areas in those areas uh, as examples where we are experiencing some labor shortage. And I believe our system has a role to play in adapting programming to meet and fill those shortages. As well, we need to recognize the important contributions that our research intensive institutions make and how that research effort contributes to more commercial application and more innovation. So now from the goal we've developed, excuse the vision, we've developed six key goals. And I'll go through these at a very high level uh, and then uh, take, uh, have some opportunity for some questions and comments. But these are the six goals that you can see in front of you. And I'll dive into each one in a little more detail. So the first goal is to improve access and strengthen the student experience. We recognize that in order for our post-secondary system to be as, as successful as possible, we need to ensure that all Albertans have opportunity to access high quality post-secondary programming. Uh, and that's particularly important for many of our uh, rural and remote communities as well. This isn't about consolidating everything into centers like Calgary or Edmonton, but making sure that individuals from all, all corners of the province can have access. And beneath each one of these uh, goals, we've identified a series of specific objectives. So yes, improving access is great, but how are we going to do that? We've identified here seven key ways in which we will do that. Uh, and I'll highlight some as an example. 1.4, through the plan, we aim to prioritize the expansion of digital infrastructure and other distance education models to help reach learners where they are. Uh, we also, under 1.6, want to improve support for foundational learning. Uh, whether that's uh, basic literacy or numeracy skills to help more Albertans unlock success through higher education and improve the transfer system. We heard loud and clear from our students that our transfer system needs some improvement because oftentimes students, like for example, at Medicine Hat College, if they transfer to another institution, may not receive full credit for all of that previous learning. 
and may often have to repeat a course or even an entire year. Uh, and, and I believe there's some significant problems with that, and I believe we need to work on improving it. So some, uh, some more detail about how we'll do that. Uh, as I mentioned, looking at changes to the transfer system uh, is essential, the prioritization of digital infrastructure, and making sure that students have the, uh, the other support services they need for success. Goal number two focuses on developing skills for jobs. And again, we've identified some key strategies to pursue here to get us there. The first one is quite an ambitious one. And the goal here is to become the first province in Canada to offer every undergraduate student a work integrated learning opportunity. Why? The reasons are so clear. Students that have that opportunity that get to participate in an internship or a co-op, on average, they're employed faster and they earn higher incomes immediately after graduation. The benefits for students are so clear and the benefits for employers are also there and it creates the right type of successful partnerships between employers and post-secondary institutions. 2.2 is also pretty exciting. We're exploring mechanisms to expand apprenticeships and create new apprenticeships. Currently, if you're participating in an apprenticeship, you're uh, pursuing a, a career in the trades, whether as a welder, a pipe fitter, uh, or other, uh, other trades categories. But we believe this apprenticeship model, whereby you learn by working, can be applied to many other careers, whether that's um, banking, finance, marketing, coding, cybersecurity, the sky's the limit. And we intend to invite applications for new apprenticeships to explore this, this new uh, approach. I'll jump over to uh, goal three, just uh, to provide a summary here. Goal three, through goal three, excuse me, we will support innovation and commercialization on our campuses. As I mentioned, our institutions are home to groundbreaking research and new discoveries. But oftentimes, these new discoveries don't translate into new products or into new businesses. And uh, regrettably, uh, in many circumstances, uh, individuals from other nations outside of Canada uh, will commercialize a lot of the research and the new discoveries that occur here. This isn't just an Alberta problem, this is a Canadian problem, uh, but I believe we need to do more to help our innovators and researchers turn their brilliant ideas into commercial application where possible. I'll jump over to goal four, which is to strengthen internationalization. And there's really two key buckets of priority and focus here. The first is to ensure that our domestic learners have opportunities to de develop international skills. We know that when they develop those international skills and bring them back home with them, they're more prepared to operate successfully in a global environment. And the second bucket has to do with attracting high quality and talented faculty, researchers, and students to come to Alberta. Many students, uh, international students, choose Canada when they're thinking about studying abroad. But those students are not choosing Alberta. They're choosing BC, Ontario. They're bringing their high quality skills with them and they're not coming to our province. And so we recognize we need to do more to attract some of the best and brightest from around the world and encourage them to come here to Alberta. Goal number five focuses on improving sustainability and affordability. We will be taking some steps to give our institutions more flexibility and less government red tape and oversight so that they can generate more non-government revenue uh, and uh, have more control over their own affairs. And furthermore, we will be prioritizing additional investments into uh, grants and bursaries, again, to help ensure that all Albertans have the opportunity 
to attend post-secondary education. And lastly, around goal six, we want to strengthen governance in our post-secondary system. We'll be looking to establish, as you can see here, a new world-class higher education strategic council that will bring the different stakeholders in our post-secondary system, including employers uh, and post-secondary presidents and students to the table together to help make decisions about the long-term plans for post-secondary education. We'll also be uh, making some changes to the way the system is governed. We'll be putting all of our colleges and polytechnic institutions into, if I can call it, one family group together and create a coordinating council for that family group so that all of our colleges and polytechnics are sitting around the table together and a separate family group for our university so that all of our universities are sitting around the table together. We believe this will strengthen collaboration, reduce unnecessary duplication, and help achieve better outcomes. So I'll, I'll uh, move to wrap up here and, and happy to take your, your questions and comments. As was mentioned, we launched this strategy on April 29th and are already moving forward in implementation. Uh, just the other day, I announced that Red Deer College will be transitioning from a college to a polytechnic institution. Uh, this is to support the Alberta 2030 outcomes. And we have more initiatives that we will be announcing in the coming weeks and months. And uh, furthermore, as you can see here, we'll continue to engage over the spring and summer to consult more with our students, uh, employers, as uh, to finalize legislation that we'll be bringing forward in the fall to make amendments to the Post-Secondary Learning Act to help create the new coordinating committees and make other changes that we need to within the Post-Secondary Learning Act. So I'll wrap up there uh, and wanna again, thank you all very much for your time. As I mentioned, these efforts that are underway in advanced education are uh, quite significant uh, and uh, I believe truly forward thinking and strategic in nature that will help support the province's recovery on a, on a broader basis. In order for us to be successful, yes, we need a strong investment attraction uh, ability within the province. We need the right conditions and climate for businesses to thrive. And that includes a highly skilled workforce. And that includes opportunities for students to receive high quality education right here at home. So uh, I want to thank you so much for, for the opportunity to, uh, to uh, share with you these, uh, these details and would love to answer any questions that you have or, uh, or any comments. Thank you again. Well, Minister Nicolaides, thank you very much for sharing that information. Uh, the Executive Director, Lisa, has been monitoring the chat and I will call on her for any questions that have emerged. Lisa. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Minister, for joining us today on, on very short notice. I'm sure um, uh, you can uh, know that we appreciate still having a government representative come and, and present to our members. If there are any members that have questions for the minister, still please feel free to post those in the chat. I do have a few questions for you. Um, I think we can all agree the goals in the 2030 plan are, are exceptional and, and certainly something we all want to work towards achieving. Do you see any existing barriers that perhaps will prevent us from achieving those goals? And if so, what efforts can be made to ensure we break down any barriers and encourage progress to achieving that 2030 plan? Yeah, thank you, uh, Lisa, great, great question. I, I think there are, there are two uh, barriers that, that we have to face. Um, one of the barriers is, I would say, um, uh, culture or collective buy-in. If our students, our post-secondary institutions, employers uh, don't believe in the objectives that we've outlined here in Alberta 2030, then we're simply going to fail in implementation. 
uh, it, it just won't work. And, and it's part of the reason why from the very beginning, uh, I wanted to ensure that we build this plan together and why we created so much, uh, so many opportunities for individuals and different stakeholders to provide their input because they needed to ensure, and we needed to ensure that uh, not just government's priorities, but the priorities of students and institutions are all reflected within the strategy. And so I, I do believe we've been uh, successful. As I mentioned, many university presidents and students have, have come out in support of, of the plan. So I do believe we've been successful, but there is always that opportunity that institution A, uh, tells us that's all well and good, but we're going down this path. Thanks, but no thanks. So um, really helping uh, institutional leaders and other stakeholders see the value and, and creating an environment to work together, I think is a, an important barrier uh, to overcome. A second key barrier that, that I see, uh, but, but I'm confident this can be addressed, could be around cost. Uh, you know, a number of these initiatives will require us to be very strategic about investment. And of course, we are facing a very challenging financial and fiscal environment right now in the province. Uh, so when, when we talk about, for example, making work integrated learning available to all students, uh, there's, it's not lost on me that we'll probably need to be very strategic in providing some uh, incentives or resources to help those efforts get off the ground or to develop new infrastructure to support that activity uh, may be needed. Uh, so we may face some challenges there as we are operating in a very challenging financial time, but, but I'm confident we can get there. Excellent, thank you. That probably leads into uh, a complimentary question to that. Um, obviously we all want to see these goals achieved, but as you mentioned, cost and buy-in can be a concern. And so with some of the recent announcements, in relation to budget for post-secondaries um, and obviously financial challenges for businesses in terms of um, you know, building their workforce. What opportunities um, do you foresee being put in place to ensure that post-secondaries have the funding available to help the government achieve its goals and their goals, as well as uh, opportunities and incentives for businesses to encourage hiring recent graduates or retraining their workforce if, if they have an existing workforce that they need to skill up? Uh, yeah, uh, Lisa, great question. And certainly a very, uh, uh, a very astute, uh, challenging environment that we're in uh, as, as we uh, are trying to operate in a more fiscally prudent way while still move important initiatives forward that are going to uh, help Albertans develop the skills that are needed for, for success in the, in the long term. And I think the key difference here is how we're, how we're using taxpayer dollars and uh, how they're supporting specific initiatives. So right now, we provide uh, and have provided over, over many years approximately $2 billion in taxpayer funding to post-secondary institutions. And that funding is not really tied to anything. And I believe that's highly problematic. And it's one of the reasons why I introduced uh, a performance-based funding model. And we'll be switching that. We, we had to delay it because of COVID, which I believe was a prudent thing to do, but we will be uh, starting that uh, in, uh, in, uh, by the end of June. At a very high level, what it does is, is it simply makes it clear that you know, Medicine Hat College or, or uh, University of Lethbridge, here's the 50 million or the 100 million that we're going to provide you as an operational grant. However, in order for you to receive that full grant, we expect to see X, Y, and Z achieved as outcomes, whether that's more students in work integrated learning, more students enrolling in programs, you know, X to Z, especially in areas where we have labor market shortages, or that you're reducing your administrative costs. Uh, and so I, because I believe it's very important for, uh, to ensure that there's strong return for taxpayers in, in, in this important investment that, that is being made. Uh, and, and as well, apart from the operational grant, which just goes to fund operations of an institution, I believe we need to be much more precise with uh, when we have 
uh, ability to use additional dollars, not just to provide it for continued operations, but to, to provide them for very specific initiatives, whether that's to uh, increase access to work integrated learning or uh, initiatives to support very specific purposes. And just quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll end my comment with the fact that when it comes to Alberta, I think it's important to, to recognize that uh, our institutions have relied quite a bit on government funding as a source of revenue, more so than uh, institutions in other provinces. I'll give you a quick example. Across the U15, that's the, the top 15 universities in the country, University of Toronto, UBC, McGill, and, and uh, U of A, U of C, and others. The average funding per student is approximately $12,000 across all 15. Uh, in 2018-19, uh, the University of Alberta was receiving $18,000 per student in funding, and the U of C about $15,000, $16,000 in funding. So institutions like McGill, University of Toronto, and many other highly uh, uh, ranked institutions have demonstrated that they can operate at world-class levels with uh, more reasonable funding levels on a per student basis. So I am very confident we can achieve success uh, with, with, re uh, with uh, reduced funding environments. I, I will also just note, there's, there's a lot of uh, change we need to make in our system. And I know many of our institutions are stepping up to the plate and taking these and uh, tackling these challenges head on. I'll give you a quick example. At the University of Alberta, uh, they're consolidating uh, uh, 19 faculties, if memory serves me correct, into three. And through some very significant and ambitious restructuring, this year alone, they anticipate that they'll save 95 million in administrative savings. So I believe examples like the U of A demonstrate that we can reduce administrative costs and operate more efficiently without sacrificing outcomes. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, now you, you mentioned the funding model and we'll probably switch over to, to employer incentives as well because I know there was announcement in the budget for that as well. Um, but you mentioned the U of A receiving 18 to $19,000 for students and this is probably selfishly just for my own information, but how does that compare to other institutions? So whether it's a polytechnic or a college or another university, is there cons consistent funding or is there different funding models for different institutions? And how do you see that changing moving forward? I know it's obviously more key performance indicators and outcome based, but will the funding model change so that there isn't you know, different advantages for universities over colleges, you know, versus apprenticeship programs. So regardless of the field of work that people want to go in, they will have equal opportunity and those post-secondaries will have equal opportunity as well for funding. Uh, great question. Uh, the short answer to that is yes. Um, uh, within Alberta, within the Ministry of Advanced Education, the ministry uh, has maybe over the course of 10 years, gone around in circles asking the question of developing a funding formula. How do we decide how much money institution A should get and how much money institution B should get? And we've gone around for probably about 10 years and we still don't have a funding formula. It's really bizarre. It's really frustrating. There is, so I as minister have ultimate discretion and authority to decide how much funding each individual institution should get. And that doesn't make any sense in my mind. Uh, I should have a, a formulaic methodology that I can plug the funding into that can uh, decide for things like enrollment, cost of programs, uh, geography, cost of delivering in different geographic regions and uh, allocate the dollars in that manner. So we don't have that. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's long overdue. Again, this has been talked about up the wazoo in the ministry for many years, but we still don't have one. So I have some real problems, as I mentioned, with the minister being able to decide on his or her own discretion and authority how much funding each institution should get. Uh, 
Uh, and I think a more um, evidence-based approach it, that looks at you know cost of programs, number of students, all of those different variables that should be taken into consideration. I mean, enrollment isn't even a variable. We don't even use enrollment to determine funding. So we have situations where institutions are experiencing more enrollment, but their funding is declining, or the opposite, where enrollment is declining, yet funding is increasing. So I know that, I think we can all agree, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, and uh, within the strategy, we did indicate that we must develop and implement a funding formula. When exactly we'll be in a position to do that, I'm not too sure. Uh, we, we still have to look at what the right timeline and priority is for all the different initiatives in this 10-year plan, but it, it must be an outcome uh, in order to ensure this plan is successful. Excellent, but we know it'll come before 2030. 100%, <laughs> we have a deadline. <laughs> Excellent. Um, that goes into another question. You mentioned enrollment, and I know some of our, our students are frustrated when they can't get into programs within our own province because there might be seats held for out-of-province out of students. How do we ensure that we can open up more opportunities for our students to get the education they desire locally right within our own province and, and remove some of those limitations that might exist? Yeah, also a very good question. I think we have to learn some, some lessons from COVID. Um, I know as much as we probably never wanna talk about it again and put it back into the rear view mirror and forget about it, lock it away in a chest and bury it in the backyard. Um, I do think we, we should still try and learn some lessons from it. And I think one of the lessons that we have learned from COVID within the post-secondary is our ability to deliver digitally. Um, and, and I know that's not the right model for every student. And, I'm, and I, I'm not suggesting that all programs all the time should be digital. But I do believe that uh, we've, we've had some opportunity to flex our digital muscle over the past uh, uh, 14 months. I know it feels like forever. But we should uh, take those lessons and see how we can use that to create more dynamic learning experiences for students. I mean, do you really need to be in a physical seat from 3.15 to four o'clock to participate in your lecture? Or can you also log in at that time online? Or even more so, can you uh, access a recorded version of that uh, lecture at 9.30 p.m. in the evening if that works for you? Uh, you know, we, we haven't done a lot to explore how, how we use digital in, in that delivery model. So I think there's opportunity there uh, to help reach more learners, because you're right, we want to ensure all Albertans have opportunities to receive high quality education right here at home. Um, the fact of the matter is, I, I think continuing to build physical infrastructure is going to be uh, challenging as we're in some uh, uh, troubled financial waters. And so we, we have to take advantage of some of those tools. And I believe digital uh, tools can help us ensure Albertans have those access opportunities. Excellent. I was just having a conversation with our local college uh, earlier this week on earning while you learn. So being able to earn during your regular full-time job during the day and being able to learn at night and, and providing more opportunities for learners, not only those who are graduating from high school and moving on, but also those within the workforce. Uh, that leads me to question that Tim, who is our new Dean within our School of Business and Continuing Studies with the Medicine Hat College. Uh, we've been working quite a bit with our local college on work integrated learning and are quite pleased to see that so prevalent in the strategy. Can you share your, the perspectives on work integrated learning that you received from business and industry and what that looks like going forward? I know you mentioned in the plan that you want to see work integrated learning in every facet of, of post-secondary education moving forward, but maybe if you can expand on that more. Sure, be happy to. Uh, Tim, thanks so much. Great to see you and, and, and thanks for the, uh, the great question. I would say, um, off the top of my head, two things that I've kind of heard or feedback I've received from business and industry around work integrated learning is, is as follows. Firstly, that we need to have more dynamic and flexible work integrated learning opportunities. 
you know, a, a lot of times the, the, the typical hire an intern for three months or the six month practicum may not fit and may not be appropriate, especially if we're going to try and get to 100% work integrated learning. So I have heard about, well, can, you know, are there more flexible models? And I, and I do believe in kind of project based work integrated learning where you uh, connect in with, with uh, a company and you work on a particular project for a couple of weeks and, and then you're done. Uh, so I think we have to look at those kinds of flexible models. Uh, but that, and that is one of the things that, that I have heard particularly from employers. One of the other things that really stuck with me, um, the two things that stuck with me that I also heard from employers. The first is that we don't do well in having, in providing uh, support for businesses and employers to hire interns. So I recall from one employer who participated in all of our engagement said, we need an intern in a box solution so that I as employer A, who never participated in work integrated learning, have never hired an intern, can take this package, intern in a box, and it can walk me through, here's how you hire an intern. Here's the kinds of things you should get them to do. Here's how you should structure the internship. Here's how you should evaluate it. And, and uh, all of that, uh, all of those important elements to ensure the internship or whatever it is, is meaningful and beneficial for the employer and for the student. Because I know many employers, sometimes they hire an intern and then they're struggling to find things for them to do. Uh, and I know that that can be a challenge sometimes. So making sure it's structured the right way is important. So uh, I have heard that. I've also heard, which also uh, really stuck with me again from another employer that participated in our engagements, is that we don't have a 1-800 hire an intern hotline, right? So if I, as, as another employer, want to actually hire an intern, who do, I, who do I call? Where do I go? Like, do I just pick up the phone and call the U of C's, uh, if I'm in Calgary, main phone number and say, hi, I'd like an intern, please? All right, how, how do we, how does this really work? And, uh, and I know for many small and medium-sized businesses, that can be a challenge. So one of the things that we're looking at, uh, and my intent is to actually develop it, is a single online work integrated learning portal so that a student anywhere in the province or an employer anywhere in the province as well, kind of like a, a Kijiji, if you will, of, of work integrated learning can post and say, we're an employer here, we do this work, we're looking for a, uh, an intern for two months to do X, Y, and Z. Or a student can say, I'm looking for an internship, I wanna get some work experience, uh, are there any opportunities out there? So we're looking at solutions like that, though, and that's coming directly from what employers and industry have, uh, have told us they're looking for. That's amazing, Minister, because it's something that we've actually already started in Medicine Hut, so we're very pleased to be working together uh, with our post-secondaries to have an employment portal and, and job matching students to employers. And just recently, um, one of our team members, Chantel Legault, was able to match 18 students with local employers. So in a matter of two months. <laughs> so it was a local success story that we're, we're very proud of. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I'm gonna, I'm sure I could sit down with you all afternoon and pick your brain and provide ideas. Our chamber recently did an economic impact report. We had over 500 businesses that we surveyed to provide a perspective on economic impacts opportunities as we move into recovery. So I would be happy to share that report with your ministry. Our chamber, as well as our college, are also members of the Joint Talent Development Task Force that was recently formed between the Alberta Chambers of Commerce and COPOA. And I believe Warren Singh from your ministry is an ad hoc member on that task force. And I think to your point, that single portal is one of the items on our agenda. So we look forward to working with your ministry as we move forward, as I mentioned, I have a ton of questions I know I could ask, but I will at this time and in respect of the time, turn it back over to Mark Keller. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Minister Nicolades. It's very uh, much appreciated, of course, to Drew Barnes and Michaela Glasgow, our MLAs. Thank you very much for joining us as well. I believe the information you shared today is both appreciated and incredibly timely. Uh, as Lisa said, we're working together and I'm quite confident that the college will be expanding its uh, connections and partnership with the, the business community. Uh, education is indeed a tool that will help the province move forward. So from here, sir, thank you again for your time. I just have a few closing remarks for the group. Uh, number one, there's going to be a town hall for Redcliffe businesses on May 26th, and of course, our business awards in October. Nominations for the awards have closed, but the nominees should be connecting to make sure to submit their information. All the upcoming events, of course, are available on the website, which is www w.mmedicinehatchamber.com. I almost gave you the college website, which would have been nice of me, but perhaps a mistake. Um, the website, the chamber website, provides a lot of updates and a resource section. All the webinars, as well as on-demand resources are available there. And there is a reminder that this is um, Mental Health Week and Mental Health Awareness Month. And we all know that we're going through difficult times as individuals, as businesses, as families. So let's take the moment to make sure we look after one another, take care of ourselves, and look for the resources that we might need to be healthy and well. So everybody take care and thank you again for joining us today.